Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video, we're doing a BIOS tour of the ASUS B650 Tough Gaming Wi Fi. This is a really good board, especially if you're getting into AM5 and looking at the newer generations. Pretty flexible board, lots of features to uh, play around with in the BIOS. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so this is the first page you'll see, and potentially, if you haven't got an operating system installed on your computer, this is going to pop up anyway before you can actually boot into anything. So, let's go. Have a quick look around. So we've got our time and date, top corner, settings cog in this top corner. You can choose your language. Also, this is a really helpful feature. So if there's something you're looking for specifically, you can use F9 or the search and just type in what it is you want to look for. That is a really quick way of doing things. I'll try and put some timestamps in the video description just to try and make it a little bit easier to find things, especially some of those key things such as expo, overclocking settings and all that kind of good stuff and possibly how to turn off RGB should you need it. Although that's pretty easy because you can just use the F4 button and it gives you a description of what each one will do. So you can turn all your LEDs on, all your LEDs off, and all that kind of good stuff. Another point here, resizable bar. This is really important for most modern systems. Make sure this is enabled. So you've got the option here for on or off, but most graphics cards and modern systems do require it, especially if you're going with an Intel graphics card. So just make sure that resizable bar is enabled. If you're using an older system and you've got some older drives which are still in the MBR, which require CSM or compatibility support module, that will actually be disabled when you enable resizable bar. So you may have to make a decision whether you want better graphics performance or access to your older hard drives. So in the information tab, we've got the motherboard model and also the current BIOS revision. This is the latest one as of March, 2024. It also tells you your processor the speed the processor is running at, and also the amount of memory installed in the system. Also here, we've got some important information. So this is something to look at straight away, CPU temperature. If your idle temperature is uh, gradually climbing and rocketing, then potentially you've got your CPU cooler mounted incorrectly. Or if you're using an AIO, maybe you've got your pump settings wrong. Just keep an eye on that, make sure that it's somewhere in around the sort of 30 to 40 degrees mark. If it's much higher than that, then you probably wanna look at your CPU mounting make sure that everything is okay. We've also got CPU core voltages and also our motherboard temperature. Ambient temperature in the room today is about 24 degrees, so 29C, five degrees over ambient is absolutely fine. Underneath this, we've got our DRAM status. So this board has four RAM slots and you should have your RAM installed in DIMM A2 and B2 for dual channel to work correctly and for the system to actually boot. It will show the default timing. So we've got some thermal tape RAM here and the lowest speed on the DDR5 or native speed is 4800, although with XMP or Expo enabled, that does go up to DDR6000. As you can see below, so we've got our Expo setting. This is something which you ideally want to have enabled. Just check with your motherboard and also your RAM to make sure they're compatible. If you enable Expo and it doesn't like it, then you can look into it a bit further, but we can probably cover that in a separate video. Other connected items here, so we've got our storage information. So we've got one NVMe drive, which is the uh, unpronounceable S500 Pro, two terabytes. And also there's a USB Kingston Data Traveler installed, which has our Windows 11 installation on it, ready for a fresh install. Moving down, we've got our fan profiles. Again, this is gonna be something which we have covered in depth in other videos, but we'll quickly go over some of the features here. So you can see which ones are actually connected and working because there will be a spinning kind of icon or animation there. So CPU optional, nothing plugged in, chassis fan one, nothing connected. You get the general idea. So on this system, we've got our CPU fan, which is actually radiator fans. And also we've got our AIO pump, which has our AIO connected and it tells you the current RPM of the pump. Our other fans in the system are all connected and daisy chained through chassis fan header number two and has given us our speeds there. You can also go into fan control, which we'll do shortly, and you can make modifications to the fan profiles. Over on this side, you've got the easy system tuning, so you can go through and choose various methods of tuning your system. So PBO enhancement or normal. So you can choose to do whichever you want. I actually prefer to leave it set to normal. You can do PBO enhancement, although it does seem that with most motherboards these days, they do tend to apply a little bit too much voltage and a little bit more aggressive and will give you higher temperatures. So I would suggest leaving it set to normal, but play with those two settings, see which works best for you. Underneath this, we've got our boot priority. So you can drag and drop these to suit which one is best. 
So currently our Windows Boot Manager, that's our two terabyte system drive, is the primary boot device, and our Kingston Data Traveler is a secondary one. If you want to change these, all you can do is just left click and drag it, and you can move it so that if we leave it set to this, it will always try and boot from our USB first, then if it can't boot from there, it will boot from our main Windows drive. Again, choose whichever you want there. If you're doing an installation for the first time, you might wanna drag your USB up to the top, and then after, drag it back down just to make booting a little bit quicker. Choice is yours. Also, you've got the boot menu, F8, so if you click on there, basically does exactly the same thing. Underneath, we've got defaults, so you can actually save all your defaults, or restore all your defaults, in fact, so if you've made any tweaks or changes and you're not too confident, you can just click on default and it will load the optimized defaults. You've also got option for save and exit, which is uh, obviously if you've made any changes, you can do save and exit, and then go back into Windows or whatever you want to do. And also you've got the option for advanced mode. But before we do advanced mode, let's take a quick look at fan control for those of you that are interested. So in fan control, you can go in, again, we've done a whole video on this, so you can choose to watch that if you want to. Q fan tune in, I would suggest doing that for the first time, just so that the system knows the high and low speeds of all the fans that are connected or pumps, etc. And also you can go in here and choose the appropriate mode for your fans. So CPU fans are generally going to be four pin PWM. If not, if it's a three pin, you can set it to DC mode, or you can choose auto detect. I find with ASUS boards, auto detect isn't particularly good. So manually setting them is the best way to go. For instance, for us here, with our chassis fan three, this is set to PWM mode. You've got options here at the bottom. So standard, silent, turbo, full speed, or manual. For most of you, I think probably manual control is gonna be the one you're looking for. So now when this is highlighted, as you can see, if we went for full speed, it would look like that. If we go for manuals like that, turbo, similar sort of curves. You get the idea. We call this a curve. It is a, a linear line or gradient, but that is our fan curve or fan profile. So I normally set them to manual and I will probably drag all the fans down whilst we're doing this just to keep the fans nice and quiet. Click on apply to make any changes and you should hear a different speed from your fans and also the RPM will change. So that, that is essentially that AIO pump again. You can set to auto detect or DC mode, whatever you want to do. If you're finding your pump is a little bit on the noisy side, you can choose a specific curve or a specific noise level, which suits you. So if we do that, click apply, immediately our AIO pump is a little bit quieter. So you might need to play around with this a little bit. You can also install Armory Crate within Windows and you can have further granular control actually in Windows whilst it's running, if that's preferable. If you don't want to do that, you can set up your fans here. So that is pretty much it for there. So let's do exit. And now we can head over into advanced mode. So in advanced mode, we've got these key settings here or tabs. And at the top, you've still got some of your shortcuts a little bit more here. So we've got the Q fan control. And yeah, basically that is very similar. The main page will tell you essentially the same as what you've seen already, just in a little bit more depth got your time date and all that kind of stuff and also options at the bottom here for security so you can set motherboard passwords and all that kind of stuff should you wish to choice is entirely up to you most people probably won't but yeah gives you all your information there so that is uh, pretty much it there let's go over to the next tab so this is ai tweaker so this is where you be doing your overclocking or just setting specific things with ram if you've got more than one expo setting you can choose whichever one works best for you Expo 1, Expo 2, or Expo Tweaked. Again, if you're not too sure what these are, when you go into any of these, generally at the bottom here, there will be an explanation telling you exactly what it is. So you can read through those at your leisure. We won't go through that now. So our Expo settings here on this particular set of RAM, that is what it's trying to dial in. If you want to, you can actually check this against your actual RAM sticks, look at the writing on the box and see if it matches up. If it doesn't, you can manually change these if you want to, or perhaps choose a different Expo setting from the top here. That is quite important to get your memory timings absolutely spot on. Underneath that, we've got our memory frequency. So this is DDR5-6000. You can set to auto if you want to. Generally, it will pick up the right settings based on your Expo settings. So you can leave that as it is. With your F clock frequency, so you can choose your frequencies here. I would suggest leaving that to auto unless you're doing some overclocking. Uh, ASUS performance enhancement. So this is something which you can enable or disable. I'm going to disable it 
um, for the reason being that the ASUS performance enhancement generally applies too much voltage and makes the processor run a little bit toasty for very little gains and in fact in some instances will actually do worse so I'm going to disable that you can choose to have it enabled or disabled do some Cinebench runs see what your temperatures and performance are like Next up, we've got the core performance boost. Again, this automatically overclocks the CPU and DRAM to enhance system performance. I generally leave this set to auto, let the system choose what it wants to do, and the same for the CPU core ratio. If you're doing manual overclocking, you can set a manual ratio, but generally I would say leave that to auto unless you know exactly what you're doing, because otherwise you can introduce instability. We've got the same sort of thing with the GPU, so onboard GPUs, you can set there to be a uh, automatic boost where possible, or you've got a manual mode. And also we've got DRAM timing control. So in here, if for some reason your memory isn't showing exactly what it says on the sticker for your purchased RAM, you can manually type in your specific CAS latencies in these boxes here. Press enter when you're done. You can also go down a little bit further in this particular section. And here are some actually some pretty important settings. So power down enable, you definitely want to have that enabled and memory context restore, you also want that enabled. Now what this will do is make your RAM train itself and also it will make the system reboot and boot up faster. If you don't have memory context restore enabled, it will try and do a full memory training at every boot, which takes a considerable time. Power down enable is also required because if the memory is trying to restore a previous context, it also needs to have the right power. So sometimes DDR5 will power down to save energy. If you reboot the system and it's in a power down state, but the system's trying to draw more power, you'll get blue screens of death. Generally, when you enable memory context restore, power down enable will automatically enable itself anyway. But if it's not, just make sure those two are definitely enabled. Uh, that is uh, pretty much it for that section there. So now we've got the Precision Boost Overdrive. So again, with this, you can leave it all set to auto. If you want to go into certain settings, you can do and change them. I think personally, the best one to go into is your Curve Optimizer. So in this one, I've actually set it to a all core negative magnitude of 30 being negative. So this is essentially just using less power for the processor. The majority of AM5 processors will work with a magnitude 30. If you're finding instability, it means it's not getting quite enough voltage. So you could try maybe 25 or 20. If you have it set to zero, that would be just normal. And you can also increase it as well, but actually adding more voltage is probably more for extreme overclocking. And also you'll need some pretty decent cooling to cope with that. Most people, I think with the curve optimizer, setting it to 30 and negative is gonna be pretty much perfect for most systems again. Give it a try, see what works for you. You've got the same option for GFX Curve Optimizer. This is for the onboard graphics, which are essentially quite rubbish at the moment for the AM5 platform. So I would probably leave that as is. Next up, we've got our DigiPlus VRM. So again, this is for load line calibration. You can, if you want to, set this manually, set the levels appropriately for your system or set to auto. Again, if this is a new system, I would set it to auto just to see that you've got stability before you start messing with your load line calibration. Load line calibration is essentially for V-droop. So if there is a voltage drop, the higher the load line calibration, it will kind of try and match those voltage changes more quickly. Again, down to the individual, I would set mine to auto, but you can do whatever you want. You've got your CPU current capability set to 100%. You can, if you want to, increase this so it will draw more current but that generally is going to lead to uh, more heat. So I would probably advise against it unless you know exactly what you're doing. Next, you've got your CPU VRM switching frequency. I'm actually not too sure what this is. So I leave that as auto. If you want to find out more about any of these things, just do a quick Google search and you'll get an explanation. Lots of these things are very much for high end tuning. For me personally, I leave this as it is. Then you've got your CPU power duty control. So that's by thermal probe or you can choose extreme. Again, this is more for overclocking. Your power phase control, again, set that to auto unless you know what you're doing. And the same for the current capabilities and switching frequencies. I would leave all those sets auto if you're doing this, unless you know exactly what it is you're changing and why, and also potentially the instability that can occur if you do change that. 
Next up, we've got our performance bias. So you can set this to, if you're trying to run Cinebench and get a bit more performance out of it, you can kind of cheat it a little bit and choose that. I would generally set this to auto or set it to none. None will probably give you better results because it's not gonna try and tweak any settings over and above what the motherboard is meant to do. Next, we've got Tweaker's Paradise. So again, you've got your clocks, spread spectrums, all these settings here, I would leave set to auto. Again, unless you know what you're doing, which I, to be honest with you, really don't. So I leave those set to auto. Next up, you've got your CPU core voltages, core local voltage readings. Again, all this is pretty much for overclocking. I would leave all these set to their defaults unless you have reason to change them. You can tweak them if you want to, but again, you can introduce instability. Maybe we'll look at these in depth in a further video. Also, we've got our advanced memory voltages. So again, you can go and change that. Sometimes if you're on a system and the actual traces are a little bit weak or that the memory controller isn't great on the processor, you can manually increase the voltage that goes to the RAM just to give you a bit more stability. Again, I would leave all of this set to their automatic or default settings. So I think that's pretty much it for AI Tweaker. Let's take a look into advanced. So we've got our trusted computing or TPM. Again, you can reset all this or enable it in here. If you're on Windows 11, you'll need to have your security device enabled. So make sure that is enabled. Not really a great deal else you want to look at in there. Then you have your TPM or firmware TPM. So you can choose whether you use the firmware TPM or you can disable it and use TPM from another module or something if you want to. And you can also reset it there. So next up, we've got the UFI variables protection. Uh, as default, that's set to enabled. I'm not too sure what that does, but I would leave it as it is. I might need to look into that a little bit more in depth. CPU configuration, this is going to be useful for some of you. So for uh, SMV or secure virtual machine for CPU virtualization, sometimes you'll find a game or a program application, whatever won't run unless this is enabled. So this is where you turn it on or off. Next, we've got our PCI subsystem settings. So this might be useful for some of you as well. So resizable bar, you can manually enable it here and also your above 4G decoding. If you've got a modern graphics card, you need to have above 4G decoding working, otherwise the RAM on your GPU won't be used or fully used. And also you've got your SR IOV support. So this is virtualization of your IO ports. You can choose to have that enabled or disabled. Next up is going to be the USB configuration. So in here you can choose uh, legacy USB support. So for older devices, you can have that on. Uh, XHCI handoff. So that is to hand off to the faster ports on the system from the operating system via BIOS. You also got USB mass storage driver support. You want to have that enabled. And also we've got our drive showing there. Also, you've got single port control. So if you want to disable a specific port on your motherboard, uh, maybe it's faulty, maybe you damaged it or something, you want to disable it so it doesn't screw up the rest of the system, you can do that. Or if there's a USB device which you just don't want people to have access to, then you can do it from there. And that is pretty much it for that section. So next is your network stack. I would leave that disabled unless you're trying to boot from your network devices, which not many people will. NVMe configuration, so it's gonna tell you what drives you've got connected their speeds, etc., and also you can do tests in those should you wish to as well. Next up is a hard drive or SAS drive. So if you've got any drives there, you can do smart tests, make sure the drives are okay. And then you've got your SATA configuration. We've got nothing plugged in here, but you can have a look through. So you can enable or disable the SATA controllers. If you don't want any drives plugged in ever, you can disable all this if you want to, and it'll just remove all of that. The choice is entirely up to you. You can also go in and choose RAID mode. So if you're doing some sort of RAID setup on your SATA ports, you can do. And also you can choose whether it's uh, AHCI or RAID. If you've got it set to RAID, you will need to install a RAID driver before you install Windows for your SATA ports to be recognized. Also you've got hot plug enabled and you can enable or disable all the individual ports should you need to. I'm actually gonna disable that because we don't use any SATA ports here. Next up, we've got our APM configuration. So this is for your power down and actually resuming by either real-time clock or PCI Express devices. So like wake on LAN, that sort of thing. ERP ready is gonna limit some of the uh, things on your system in terms of power. So if you have that disabled, that means your USBs and all that will be on when the system is powered down, but still has power going into it. If you wanna turn off all of your 
LEDs and also anything which is connected via USB. When the system is actually turned off fully, you can set that to enabled and that should do that for you. You also got option for restore AC power loss. So if the power turns off for some reason, you can choose it so the system will reboot itself or power back on. Just an option of the last state as well. So if the PC was on, it will return to be on. If it was off, it will stay off. Yes, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, maximum power saving. Again, you can choose to do that if you want to. If you have enabled, it will, like it says, it will just try and save as much power as possible. You also got power on by PCIe and also power on by real-time clock. If you enable that, you can set specific times where the system actually turns itself on. Whether or not that's of use to you, I don't know, but you can do it should you wish to. Next up is our onboard devices. This is going to be useful to a lot of people. If you're using a Intel graphics card, native ASPM, you're going to want to turn that on. Generally set to auto and also the mode control, you can choose L1 or L0. L1 is what you'll need for Intel graphics cards to get the uh, power savings out of them. Also, you've got a bifurcation of your PCI Express ports. So if you want to split up your available resources on your PCI Express, then you can choose Auto 8x8, PCIe RAID mode, or GPU with M.2 storage. So if you are using a graphics card that has an M.2 drive built in, you can set it so that the bifurcation mode will automatically detect that and allow it to work. I would set it to auto unless you have reason to do otherwise. HD audio, you can choose to enable or disable the onboard sound. The same goes for the Wi-Fi controller and also the Bluetooth controller. So if you don't want Bluetooth, you can disable that. If you want Bluetooth enabled, you can enable that. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, LED lighting, again, this is a, uh, another setting which you can go in to choose. So this is pretty straightforward. So LED lighting, when the system is in a working state, i.e. on, you can choose to have all the LEDs on, stealth mode, Aurora only, or Aurora off. Again, you can read through the individual bits of this at the very bottom there. Um, I'm going to choose all on because I like to have them on. When the system is in sleep, hibernate or soft off states, again, you might want to turn all your LEDs off. So again, the choice is entirely up to you. Realtek LAN controller, so you can enable or disable the onboard LAN and also USB power delivery in a soft off state. So if your PC is hibernating or off, but powered on at the wall, you can choose to have your USB power delivery on or off. I'm going to disable that because I don't want power delivery when the system is turned off because otherwise my thermal tape displays remain on. Next up, we've got serial port configuration. Uh, if you're using a separate serial port, which is attached to the system, you can enable it and also give it an IRQ or interrupt. I'm actually going to disable that because I haven't got one. Uh, PCIe link speeds, you can change those as well. So depending on which port it is, so you've got your PCI Express times one slot at the top, M.2s, chipset links, all that kind of stuff. You can choose those however you see fit. I would generally leave those set to auto unless you have a reason to do otherwise. So that is pretty much it for onboard devices. Uh, what else we've got here? Northbridge or yeah, Northbridge configuration. So your primary video device, you can set to PCIe video, which is going to be your on, which is going to be your separate graphics card. IGFX is going to be the onboard. So if you if you're only using onboard, it'll default to whichever one it is anyway. Integrated graphics, you can choose to have auto, and also the frame buffer size. You can choose how big a buffer is allocated to the onboard graphics. Generally, I'd say probably two gig is probably the best, but. Generally, if you set it to auto, it will automatically use whatever resources it requires. If you don't want to have the uh, AMD Radeon drivers installed, maybe you've got an AM5 set up, but you've got an NVIDIA graphics card and you don't want to have both sets, you can just set that to disabled. If for some reason you want to force it because you want to use it as an output, but you've also got a separate display, then you set it to force and then it will, it will always try and enable it regardless if there's a graphics card in there or not. Um, I'm actually going to disable mine because I don't really use it. Then we've got our uh, common options for the North Bridge. So again, more settings here you can change should you wish to. Just another way of getting to some of those other things. So graphics configuration, again, you can choose to go into there. Audio configuration, you can choose whether the Zilla is enabled or audio IOs. Chances are you don't need any of this stuff at all. Motherboards are getting more and more complicated and uh, a lot of these options are very high level stuff. 
in here. So you've got your PPT control, thermal controls, etc. So this is for overclocking and kind of works in conjunction with your core optimizations. So you can set your individual settings here for timings, PPT control, thermal control is probably going to be the one that people are going to be wanting to look at. So if you use a manual, you can set your TJ Maxx. So if you don't want your processor going over a certain temperature, you can put it in here and that will be in Celsius. So if you don't want your CPU to go over more than say 90 degrees, type in 90, you get the general idea. Again, for stability's sake, unless you know what you're doing, I would leave this set to auto. One setting here, which is actually quite an easy thing to do. So if you've got a processor, which is like a 95 watt or 100 watt or more, and you want to just enable eco mode to make it run cooler and quieter, you can enable eco mode. That's actually quite a useful thing to do for some processors if your cooling isn't quite up to it. And actually some processors do actually work better in eco mode, it seems. But again, down to the individual. Use your system, see what it's like. If thermals are getting out of control, then you can uh, hit eco mode. And we've also got AMD overclocking. Again, you can go, and this is another way essentially of accessing all those other features that we had previously. So you can go through voltage control, manual CPU overclocking, your precision boost overdrive, which you can set to auto, or you go to advanced. Then you can go to the core optimizer settings again. So yeah, it's uh, very similar to what we had previously. So if you then go into PBO limits and yeah, you can disable, do whatever. Position boost overdrive, I think for most people, it's probably gonna be left set to auto or possibly even disabled. The choice is gonna be you, down to you, the quality of your silicon, the quality of your cooling, all that kind of stuff. So next is gonna be monitor. So this is pretty self-explanatory again. So temperature monitor. So you can see what temperatures things are running at, your GPU, chipset, and all that kind of stuff. I do find actually the chipset runs relatively warm on here. I think it's because it's a slap bang next to the graphics card. So yeah, that does seem to run a little bit hotter. It doesn't seem to cause any problems, but it does run a little bit hotter. Also you've got your fan speed monitor, so you can check your fans again. This is just replicating what we've seen previously. Voltage monitor is actually quite a useful one. So you can check your voltages, make sure there's nothing uh, weird going on. At the moment, we're pretty much well within our nominal values. If you go into the 12 volt, for instance, and it's reading like 11.5 or dropping low, then you probably want to look at your power supply. Same for the 5 volt and 3.3, those are the kind of key ones really. Make sure they're all roughly about right. So 3.3, we've got 3.28, that's absolutely fine. And our 5 volt is 4.98, which is yeah, within margin of error, definitely. Also, we've got QFAN configuration. So again, this is uh, a more kind of text-based version of what we had previously. So you can go in and set your individual settings there, PWM, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I find it easier to do it actually in the QFAN settings previously. Also got the option here for chassis intrusion detection support. Uh, this is disabled. I don't think any cases these days actually come with that. It's a, a quite a rare thing to see. So that is it for monitor. Let's go to boot. So this is where you can turn on CSM or compatibility support, support mode. This is for older drives, which are an MBR, not UEFI. Again, this will disable some features on UEFI systems. You also got secure boot, so you can, if you need to enable secure boot, then you can do it in here. This isn't really necessary these days because most of the settings needed for Windows 11 are done via BIOS updates, so they're kind of Windows 11 ready. You also got your boot configuration, which is essentially what we looked at previously to some extent. So you've got your fast boot. I'm actually going to disable that because fast boot is something you don't necessarily need. It's uh, not what you think it is. And also setup mode. So if you want to go into easy mode every time that you go into the BIOS, you can choose that, or you can go straight into advanced mode. So you can do what you want there. Uh, for most people, I think easy mode is absolutely fine. Boot options you've got there, and also you've got boot override. So if, say for instance, after going in the BIOS here, we want to boot straight from our USB, you can click on that USB drive, and then when we reboot or when we save and exit, it will try and boot from there. So that's just a quick way of boot overriding. So you don't actually have to change your boot options or boot priorities. So that is it for the boot section. In tool, we've got the option for the ASUS Easy Flash 3 utility. So for flashing the BIOS actually within the BIOS. So if you've got a processor which is supported, you can flash your BIOS in here if you want to. And also you've got the option for BIOS image rollback support. Uh, you've got ASUS Secure Erase, so that's for erasing drives. You've also got your ASUS user profile, SPD information for the RAM sticks. So this will give a JDIC reading or read from the actual RAM. 
Also, Asus Armory Crate, you've got the option to download and install Armory Crate app. I'm gonna set that to disabled. If you wanna install it, you can do, but this is somewhat of a vulnerability in modern systems where they can actually falsify the information. So you download uh, Armory Crate from basically a, a bogus source. We, yeah, we'll leave that disabled. And then you've got My Asus as well. So you can, again, same sort of thing, download and install My Asus service and app. I would suggest leaving both of those set to disabled. So that is pretty much it. We'll come to the last one now. So this is exit. So you've got the option here. So if you're gonna chicken out a little bit, you can just hit load optimize defaults. Alternatively, if you're happy with the changes you've made, you can do save changes and reset. If you, again, not too sure, you can discard any of the changes you've made and it'll revert to how it was when you first booted into the BIOS. And also you've got the option to launch the UFI shell from USB drives. So that is gonna basically try and load Windows if you've got a drive with Windows 10 or Windows 11 on it. We are gonna do save changes and reset because uh, we're happy. We made some changes there which are necessary, especially disabling those features from my Asus and also Armory Crate installer. So that is it. We're gonna do save changes and reset. It'll give you a list of all the things which it's gonna change. I've also done the USB power delivery, so that's actually very handy for me because that was something which was annoying me with a keep on meaning to do, but I haven't done. And yeah, we're all good. So I'm happy with that. I'm gonna click OK and it will reboot the system now. Okay, so there you go. There is a tour of the boss on the Asus B650 Gaming Tough Wi-Fi or Tough Gaming Wi-Fi. I can never get that right. Uh, hopefully this video has been useful to you. If it has, smash the like button and leave a comment in the video description. Let us know how helpful it is. And also let us know what you actually looked for in the BIOS but couldn't find and whether or not this video helped you find it. That'd be actually really useful information going forward. So when we make more of these videos, we can see what content or which areas we need to focus on more so. Again, any of the options in the BIOS which you're not sure of is super easy. Just type it verbatim as it is into Google or your search engine of choice and you'll generally come up with a, a decent explanation for some of those in-depth things. And also if you follow some of the tutorials online, you'll see that things like PPT and all those kinds of things, it will make sense when you get into it. But realistically, most of it you don't really need to know. You can set it to auto and it should just work absolutely fine. But if that isn't the case, you're more than welcome to join our Discord chat and ask any questions you may have there, or of course, obviously put it in the comments section below. I think it's gonna wrap this video up. I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.